is that this is the first Zoominar I've tried this out on. So everybody will have to be patient with me and we'll hopefully get better as we go. So there are 11 species of turtles that are reported in Maine. Three of them are marine and eight of them are terrestrial aquatic. One of them is introduced the red-eared slider, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, some are listed, the leatherback, the Kemp's Ridley, the spotted turtle, the Blanding's turtle are listed federally, as well as the eastern box turtle, listed federally and state. And then the wood turtle is a species of concern here in Maine. So what do they look like? The musk turtle or the stink pot is a small, this is an adult that I'm holding right here. So it's got a bit of a dome shell. It spends most of its time in the water. So you'll often find that it has algae all over the shell. It has three yellow stripes along its neck and sometimes they're interrupted stripes like these are, they're not solid stripes always. And you can barely see that there are a couple of sensory barbels that they sense what's in the environment around them. They also have a hinged plastron. They're considered common in Maine, although you rarely see them because they're so aquatic. Spotted turtle. This is also a small, think hockey puck sized turtle. Smooth carapace. It has very distinctive yellow dots on the upper shell. Um, those dots are unique to each, the pattern of those dots is unique to each individual. And then they make use of both aquatic and upland terrestrial areas. And that's one of the reasons why they are so at risk because of development has sort of interrupted that connective corridor. Um, they are listed as threatened in Maine which is not quite as, um, it's not as close as endangered, but it means that they suspect within a generation of turtles, they may become endangered. And that means that there's a number of individuals and the population is so small that there's not enough to breed to keep the population going or that the habitat has been so reduced there isn't enough habitat to support the turtles that are present. The wood turtle, sometimes called old Mr. Redlegs. Um, its front of it is, uh, underneath its chin is often red, red, orange. Its front legs, which is how it gets its nickname, is that same red, orange. And the other, kind of feature that identifies it as the wood turtle is if you were to look at its scutes, they're very pyramidal. And you can see in the diagram how pyramidal it is. And if you take the time to look at the two photographs, you can almost see in the light that each scute has a high point in the center of it. The painted turtle, the ubiquitous painted turtle. Um, it has a smooth shed shell. It's a little bit larger. It's painted in that you'll see on the edge of the shell in the lower photograph, there'll be red, quote unquote, painted on it. It has a, several yellow stripes along its head. And um, sometimes you'll see red blotches along that same head area. They've been known to live 35, 40 years in the wild. And they're known, they're considered really common here in Maine, um, partly because we see them in the spring and partly because we have an issue with all, all our species, not just turtles, um, is shifting perceptions. And, we, and it's very hard to kind of know how common they were because on these long lived species, we don't have historic memory of how many were there 20 years ago. We just know that there seems like a lot of them today. So that's always 
the challenges of common quote unquote species. And you'll hear ecologists talk about keeping the common species common. So even though these are common, we still are very interested and want to take care of them as well. Um, all these turtles that we're going to talk about, all turtles actually, have unique courting um, rituals. Some of them, the males will um, kind of nip the hind legs of the females or the male and the female will bob their heads back and forth at each other. Um, the male, you can tell a male painted turtle from a female painted turtle because the male has very long four claws on its four limbs, the front limbs, and the claws are maybe two and a half times longer than the claws on the female. And they um, will approach a female turtle underwater and they'll swim backwards while they're stroking the female as his courting ritual. And I was lucky enough to catch this in action we're going to try and see how this goes. Um, the other thing that's really interesting to me about this particular short video is if you watch how he uses his hind legs. I, I don't know how many of you canoe, but you know how you feather a paddle. He's feathering his broad, webbed, strong legs so that he can swim backwards as the female swims towards him. And right there, you can see how long his claws are on the front there as he strokes the female's head and swims backwards. I love watching this. <laughs> the snapping turtle. The snapping turtle is one that, again, we're all really aware of, particularly in the month of June, we've probably seen them on the side of the road. They have a serrated rear carapace. You can see that in the lower left-hand image. They also have really tall scales on the ventral side of the tail, and there's three rows of them, and it makes them almost look prehistoric. And um, the other thing I'd like you to know is if you look at the upper right photograph, you'll see that the bridge between the carapace upper shell and the plaster on the lower shell is very narrow. And the plaster on is also very small. So you see a lot of flesh in the turtle. So why most people think of Snapping turtles is aggressive, um, really kind of scary creatures. I like to think of them as actually proactively defensive. Because if you think about it, if a fisher were to attack a snapping turtle and it, could, and it was able to flip it over on its shell, it would have a nice tasty dinner really easily. But because the snapping turtle makes use of its snake-like head, its serpentine-like head, to whip it around when it's got its powerful jaws and its really strong claws that you can see in the lower image, um, it's able to defend its territory against those types of predators. And you'll see if they are being harassed that they'll try to put the widest part of their shell towards the predator in an effort to make it hard to fit into the animal's mouth. Um, so it has these strategies that give it a bad name just to take care of itself. This is the uh, red-eared slider, which again, has been found here within the mid-coast watershed, but it's a non-native. It's gotten there by way of the pet trade. Um, and it's actually the turtle that's everywhere in every continent of the world except the Antarctic. And it's gotten to all those places by way of pet trades. Um, I don't know if how many people 
as kids had the dime store turtle, it was the red-eared slider. And they're very long lived. They're again, a 35, 40 year pet. And many times um, kids lose interest in their turtle or they get left behind after they graduated from college and people think, oh, I'll take the turtle and I'll put him out where the turtle belongs instead of in the aquarium like this one is. Um, that is not a good idea because they overwinter number one in Maine and they have been known to breed in Maine and they've known to be, be invasive. And an invasive species, for those who don't know, is a species that um, disrupts the ecosystem to the point that the native species are not able to survive. And the red-eared slider is an opportunistic omnivore, which means it eats anything that's green, algae, cattails, often leaving um, other turtles short of the foodstuffs they need. Because of this um, potential of becoming an invasive species in Maine, in 2010, a law was passed that prohibited the sale of red-eared sliders in Maine. And I guess the other thing I'd like to just say real quickly is if for some reason you were to stumble onto a red-eared slider, I would call um, IFNW or I would call a, a wildlife rehabilitator because I really don't want to leave a red-eared slider in the wild. And then the next question you're going to say is how can I be sure it's a red-eared slider and not a painted turtle? Um, in the distance, they look very, very similar. Their shells look very similar. The glare of the sun makes them very similar. But the really dichotomous thing is that you can see in this picture that red just behind the eye, that is going to always be there if it's a red-eared slider. That will not be there if it's a painted turtle. So that's how you would know, and you would know you need to do something other than put it back where you found it. So why do we care? Why do we care about turtles? Um, historically, through the ages, they've been one of the largest biomasses among vertebrates. And when a species has a lot of biomass, and biomass is basically the number of that species times the actual mass of that species. Um, large biomass means they tend to dominate an ecosystem. They tend to drive the ecosystem's function and services. Um, the other thing is, for people who don't know, we think about biomass and not bio weight because aquatic turtles weigh less when you have them in the water. So we as scientists always think biomass. Also, uh, turtles are critical nutrient and mineral vectors between the aquatic systems and terrestrial systems. And first time, <laughs> they become part of that cycle is when the eggs are laid. And the first 48 hours while there's an odor, they're often predated, as you can see in this image to the right, by raccoons, foxes, woodchucks, dogs even. Um, and they get a high density um, piece of nutrition. Then when the hatchlings, if they make it as far as to hatching, they're blue herons love them, they consider them delectable delights. Um, and they're often hatchlings and aquatic turtles are often sharing the same um, ecosystem as the blue herrings. Um, blue herrings tend to, um, their rookeries are in beaver compounds often where there's a lot of dead trees. And you'll see here that this is really typical that um, while blue herons are solitary, when they're in the rookery caring for their young, they do it collectively. And that's to sort of protect the young from predators such as the eagle. Um, the eagle, there's a biodiversity research lab in Falmouth, um, had uh, a webcam on an eagle nest and they found painted turtle shells in the eagle nest. So you can see that there's a lot of nutrients moving around there. 
Um, they also provide important ecosystem functions, which are functions or any process that occurs within the ecosystem. So they're often keystone species. And an example of a keystone species is the Florida gopher tortoise, um, has been known to dig burrows up to uh, 30 feet, 10 meters, 30, 30 feet, 30 and a half feet long. And they have found 340 different animals and invertebrates rely on those burrows as critical parts of their life cycle. So if the gopher tortoise were ever extirpated from the Florida area, there would be a gaping hole in that um, ecosystem. Just their digging often builds soils because they move the nutrients from the upper layer to the lower area. And then just like this um, Eastern box turtle that's shown in this image, they also disperse seeds and in dispersing the seeds, they enhance the germination. So box turtles and wood turtles in Maine eat seeds, both of them. Um, the seeds go through their digestive tract. The, endo, uh, the outside of the seed, the endocarp, or that hard surface like on your beans when you soak them, um, that gets scarified through the digestive tract. And then when the seeds and the fecal matter is deposited in the landscape, there's a little bit of nutrition left with every seed, like a little fertilizer packet, which enhances the germination. And this has been shown with wood turtles particularly to be important because as they eat the upland seeds, as they deposit them along the stream edges or the river edges, that enhances growing of grass. And then when there's a major storm event, it, that grass will, um, help mediate, mediate any erosion attributed to that event. They also provide ecosystem services and services as different than functions, services are things they do for us, humanity. Um, they can be used to restore degraded ecosystems. They've also been used to study pollution concentration. Um, snapping turtles like this one, um, can tolerate living in really toxic waters, the waters laden with PCBs or even heavy metals. I was involved with a methylmercury study in the Adirondacks where we trapped and sampled um, snapping turtles to see the bioaccumulation of the mercury. Um, and they're also a food source for humans. They have been um, for tradition through Asia, through Northern America. Um, that has been outlawed here in Maine because of, of an urge to protect them, but they still do serve that function. And they're just plain cool. Um, so that's a snapping turtle. These are painted turtles basking and then the swimming turtle is a map turtle, which isn't here in Maine. Um, so what are some of the threats to turtles? Well, development is one of them. Um, every time we build a house or a shopping center, um, we're taking away some of their habitat. So it's habitat loss, degrading their habitat, the fragmentation of their habitat. And when I say fragmentation, I mean putting holes in what they need for their home range, or disrupting the connectivity they need from their water resources or their upland resources. Um, the illegal pet trade, even though it's illegal in Maine and many places to um, own or possess a wild turtle. Um, some of the turtles are very intelligent and continue to have appeal in the illegal trade. And then there's climate change, of course. Um, turtles have what is called temperature sex determination. So unlike mammals, us, where we have X and Y chromosomes that get together um, to make males or females, boys or girls, um, the trigger for a male and a trigger for a female 
is the temperature of the egg while it's being incubated in the nest. And um, most of the turtles, especially here in the Northeast, um, if the nest um, temperature is in the higher range of viable, you get all females. So it's easy to imagine, and this is a, a focus area of study, is what will happen, um, that if the nests were always warmer than they have been historically, we may not get males, the all important males. So it's interesting to see what climate change does. Um, so those are some of the threats to turtles. So what can we do, how, where can we find them, I guess is the next question. So we all wanna see the turtles and then how can we protect these habitats? Musk, musk turtles are strictly aquatic. They like soft bottoms with a lot of organic matter, a lot of detritus. And um, as I've already said, they're mostly aquatic. They have basically a nocturnal or some of them are crepuscular um, feeding habits. And um, so that's where you'd expect to find them. Any place like a beaver impoundment where you're gonna have a lot of organic matter on the bottom, slow moving streams possibly, um, oxbows again where they're sort of filling in with vegetation are good places to look for musk turtles. Spotted turtles as blanding tur also as blanding turtles require an aquatic um, and a terrestrial assemblage that are connected that they can get to one and the other without being at risk. So typically um, spotted turtles overwinter in the wet area, they might be in a very dense hummock burrowed in like the lower left picture where you've got that kind of um, scrub shrub boggy area, they'll be into the roots there where there's a lot of moisture. Then when spring and the ice out comes, they will hang out in the wetland area or the vernal pool, they'll mate. The females will leave the wetland and then they'll nest. They will generally return to the wetland. And then as the summer gets warmer, um, both the Blanding's turtle and the Spotted turtle will spend the summer investigating in the uplands. And evestating is another metabolic state that's similar to hibernating or ruminating, um, where their heartbeat slows, their breathing slows, their consumption of calories slow, and they try to find a cool spot they can stay away from the heat and the, the drought. So you'll see them under the leaf litter for the summer. Then in the fall, um, they'll return to the wetlands to overwinter. The um, hatchlings will typically emer uh, will typically hatch in the fall and sometimes emerge in the fall and sometimes they will emerge in the spring. And that's sort of driven by temperature and what they're finding is by latitude as well. Whereas the more northern populations, like there's a population in Ontario that's been heavily studied, um, they'll typically emerge in the spring, um, even though they hatched in their nest in the fall. Wind turtles. Wind turtles are also aquatic and terrestrial, but their aquatic portions are these more riparian areas, these drainage ditches, these very slow moving, maybe the outfall stream from the beaver pond. Um, they'll move through these scrub shrub um, or shrub scrub um, areas, sort of like you're seeing in the, uh, in that lower right picture. And it's, again, we find them more often in the upper terrestrial area, but we're also learning as we study them more that they're spending a fair amount of time in the riparian areas, it's just we're not able to see them as easily. They're much more um, camouflaged, they're much more elusive, and they're just getting away from us. Painted turtle habitat. Um, shallow ponds, sloths, slow moving creeks, large lakes, if there's a place for them to bask or hide out in the evening. 
and they thrive in waters with a lot of aquatic vegetation and basking sites. Um, you can see that large woody log that fell into the water. That's a great turtle basking site. And then these cattails are also um, really typical of a place you might find a painted turtle. Um, and I'm wondering if you guys were to look at this picture really closely, do you see any painted turtles? I mean, first thing you're going to be thinking, not in the tree. So we're going to look along into the shadows of the water. We're going to look along um, adjacent to the vegetation. We're going to look and see if on the left there's a log that maybe they're going to be basking on. And then if you look closely, this is an interesting story. A number of years ago, I took this picture as an example of good habitat. And as I was doing it, I realized that there's four turtles in this picture. And I don't know how many of you caught that, but there they are. So this was pretty late in the summer. As you can see, the sun's really out. So turtles being ectotherms or um, cold-blooded reptiles, they have no way of regulating their temperature except by moving to an environment that's more hospitable. So that's why you'll see in the early spring where it's really kind of cool air, but really hot sun, you'll see them all out congregated basking together. And as the summer goes on, you'll go back and you want to take your friend to go see the turtles and the turtles aren't there. Well, they're there, but they're thermal conforming to the water temperature because that's more hospitable for them. Snapping turtle habitat. Basically, they're found almost anywhere. They prefer shallow waters or slow moving waters because surprisingly, they're not that strong a swimmer. Um, they also can be found in brackish coastal waters. Um, there's a study population that a professor at Bowdoin was studying up in uh, Bodenham for a number of years. They are opportunistic. They they'll eat anything. And they're also what we call gape inhibited, which is to say that if they can fit it in their mouth, they'll eat it. Um, they'll eat anything from the roots of cattails, um, sedges, all the way up to ducklings. We've all heard the story about a snapping turtle getting a ducking, duckling. Um, because they're not great swimmers, they don't tend to chase after fish. If you see them eating a fish, the fish was probably sick or was already carrion. Um, they're kind of what we call um, wait and pray. So they just kind of hang out and when they see an opportunity, they take that long neck and shoot out and grab something. So what can we do to protect turtles? One, we can maintain the mess. I don't know how many times, including my own family, have tried to clean up their waterfront because it just doesn't look very garden-esque. It doesn't look very inviting. Um, so leave the large woody debris, leave some of the ingrown bulrush, um, and Think like a turtle, I guess, is the best way I could say. And imagine what a turtle would need and resist the urge to make your landscape conform to your needs and allow it to provide for the turtles. Um, maintain distance from nesting turtles, protect nesting sites. Um, don't use balloons at celebrations, use bubbles. Some of you may already know that um, Leatherback turtles, their primary food source is jellyfish. And when you see them following the jellyfish with the warmer temperatures up into the North Atlantic or Labrador, they have been finding that there's balloons that have been killing them in, and they find the balloons in their belly. So go for the bubbles, get rid of them. The other thing, they, we could all reduce our um, plastic footprint would be another good thing to do for the marine turtles specifically. We could also, um, yeah, anyway, make sure that your kids don't bring the turtles home and want to turn them into pets. If your kids bring you, bring you a turtle, which is great, I'm all for having everybody enjoy a turtle, return the turtle to exactly where it came from. The turtle is there for whatever reason. And even if it's on the side of the road, we took the side of the road. 
um, keep your dogs from um, disrupting a turtle. Um, so those are those are the other some other things we can do. Um, this is from Phippsburg this spring. Um, we have a little video of a painted turtle laying eggs. Painted turtles um, will lay typically six to 30 eggs in a clutch, although there is one record of 106 eggs in the south. Um, up here in the northern regions, they only typically nest once. Again, in the south, they might nest twice a season. Um, and you can see that in between laying an egg, she rolls the egg into the other eggs and then tamps down a little bit of soil with it. And this is another reason I like this. Notice Mr. McAllen is dutifully giving her her space. And um, so that's kind of a cool little video. Um, so we can also preserve habitat and the quarters between habitat. And this is where we need to do these things collectively. This is where Kennebec Estuary Land Trust, this is where Mid Coast Conservancy can kind of pool our efforts and we can preserve some of these wetlands and some of the uplands um, and the corridors between them. And we can do it by easement or we can do it by outright ownership. Um, but all these things are critical to the turtle. We can beware of turtles and the roadways. So some of you might think this is an alewife fish passage, but in fact, it's a turtle corridor. Um, and so one thing we can do is we can encourage when infrastructure is installed, it's installed to accommodate all species, but turtles in particular. Um, if you look at this against the back wall, you'll see you have a couple of ramps that drop into the water and they drop, come back out of the water at the downstream V-notch where for the fish. And that ramp was designed specifically for the turtle because the V-notch wares would have created a bluff barrier to their passage. And we had seen a number of turtles in this area, so we needed to accommodate them with the culvert. Um, so what can we do? We can drive mindfully. We can move turtles off the road or out of the traveled way. We could participate in um, citizen science. IFMW and Maine Audubon have a program called Wildlife Road Watch Survey, and they have one in specific, which is um, the Maine Turtle Roadkill Survey, I think it's called. Um, you could do that. You could also, if you found a turtle in the woods in one of your walks, you could take a picture and make an entry in iNaturalist. Um, there's any number of things we can do. We can share the love. Um, you can share your excitement for turtles. I guess the one thing that I would hope that everybody takes away from this little talk is that protected and protection are verbs. And that once we feel like we've protected a species, we really need to continue that and keep doing it into the future. And to do that, we need young turtle protectors. So it's really important to me anyway, and I hope to everybody else, that not only do we share our excitement for turtles, but we share it with the young people. So, um, I guess, I think that's everything I have to say. Um, I guess I would just like to thank um, Kelt and Mid Coast Conservancy again for inviting me to talk about something that's especially dear to my heart. Um, then I know that we had some questions come into us um, that we'll try and answer, and I don't know if any. Ben or um, Ruth, any have come in since I've been talking? Um, yes. So I guess yes. let's open it up to questions. Thank you, Karen. Um, we'll start with some of the questions that came in through the registration process. Um, the first one uh, came from someone just wondering a little bit more about snakes and I guess what their 
interactions might be with turtles? Um, so they were asking about snakes or about if I know anything about snakes. If, yeah, just about snakes in general. Yeah, um, I don't really know anything about snakes. Um, I know that one of the public announcements uh, called me a herpetologist. Um, it made me think about what am I really? I'm actually a turtle geek, but there is a word for um, turtle geeks. It's, I just learned this tonight, uh, a testudinologist which is to say it's someone that studies turtles <laughs> and testudines are a suborder of, or a subclass of um, reptiles. And it's the ones with that bony outer shell. So it's turtles. Um, so I really don't know much about snakes other than I cohabitate with a few of them. <laughs> Great, well, thank you. The next question is, uh, uh, what is a safe way to pick up a snapping turtle? And uh, they were also interested in seeing how that, that, uh, how that works, if you happen to have a snapping turtle with you right now. I do. Well, here we go. Um, so I get asked a lot, how do you move a turtle? And what that usually really means is, how do I move a snapping turtle? Um, I mentioned that if there's a turtle in the roadway, move it. Um, so the first thing I would say is always do it in a way that assures your safety and the safety of others. Um, this picture is hot off press. It was from this weekend up on Route 1 in Machias. Um, and the only thing that I wish we had in there is the tractor trailer that just went by. Um, so the other thing is make sure you can do it safely and always move the turtle in the direction that the turtle is traveling. So what that means is even if you have an aquatic turtle and the pond is where it was coming from, don't take it back to the pond. It wants to go where it wants to go. Then it means what that also means is if the turtle is on the edge of the road or on the first tire of the road, but it wants to get all the way across to the other side of the road, take it all the way across to the other side of the road. Don't just set it off to the shoulder. Um, so always in the direction the turtle's traveling, always with your safety and others in mind. So if you want some ergonomics, um, first thing I would say is if you're moving a snapper, get some gloves. Um, I was not in a gloved situation, so I just went for it. Um, and if you look at my picture there, you'll see that I've grabbed it from the back half or the lower right where the legs come out of the carapace. Grab it firmly there. Notice that I've locked my elbows into my hip bones because that turtle probably weighed 15 to 20 pounds and its neck was thrashing and it was mad. And the last thing you wanna do is drop it. So I've got it locked into me. I'm pulling it kind of close, but not too close to my body. Um, and you also notice that I'm holding the turtle not on a horizontal position, but relatively vertical. And that's to keep the weight close to your body. It gives you a little more control over the turtle and it helps keep you from dropping it by accident or it helps keep the turtle um, safer. I've heard of people trying to lift turtles up by their tails. I've heard people try to lift them up by one of the rear legs. Um, I wouldn't do either of those. You could hurt their tail and that having all that weight on their tail could actually break their back inside the shell. Um, then you'll notice the little picture on the right. Yes, you might get a little laceration even with this methodology, which is why best case scenario, there's gloves involved. Um, so always safely, always in the direction of travel and I guess just try to be smart about it. Great, thank you. Um, the next question we have is uh, what kind of turtles live in Sandy Pond? or Freedom Pond, um, and what are their I have never, I've never been to Freedom Pond, Sandy Pond, but I did look it up in the uh, 
main reptiles atlas, which is something that um, you can access online through the state website. Um, and there are no records for that pond specifically, but knowing what the pond is about, um, I would expect that you would see snapping turtles, painted turtles, and probably musk turtles. I don't think in that pond situation, because it's so deep, relatively deep, I don't think you would see spotted landings, wood turtles, and hopefully you don't see a red-eared slider. So that's what I'd be thinking about looking for if I went out looking for turtles there. Okay, great. Um, next question is, how and where do turtles live in the winter? That is a very good question. Every turtle has its own hibernacula. Um, there was a time when I was very curious about that, and I had a population of map turtles in northern New York that I left radios on over the winter because I too wanted to know how they spent their time. Um, most of them, well, the aquatic turtles are typically under ice. Um, uh, the box turtles will be in leaf litter, like maybe if you had a pile of leaves close to their home range, they bury themselves in that. Box turtles also um, have a physiological change, so the glycol in their blood, the concentration of glycol goes up somewhat like wood frogs do. You know, you've all probably heard that wood frogs could survive a freeze if they come out in the spring. That's the uh, Eastern box turtle has a similar phenomena. I've already told you where spotted turtles spend their winter, blanding turtles in a similar place. Um, musk turtles will spend their winter um, on the bottom, um, usually maybe as much in some cases as 12 inches into the detritus that's on the bottom. Um, interestingly enough, um, Musk turtles actually have what they call a bimodal breathing physiology, which is to say that if they spend um, extended periods of time underwater, even when they're not um, overwintering, they'll be um, breathing by gulping, activating muscles in their throat and their trachea. They'll be breathing through their skin, through bursters in their skin, and they have a third methodology where methods, not methodology, method, um, where they breathe through bursters in their cloaca. Um, the turtle that you see in this image here uh, breathes in the winter through its skin and through its cloaca. Um, you can see here that it's got its limbs a gimbo, so that there's a lot of um, skin surface in the water. Um, let's see, who else? Painted turtles are similar. They overwinter on the bottom, basically. And so do snapping turtles overwinter on the bottom. Awesome. Aaron, what's cloaca? Um, a cloaca is, um, it's an orifice into which the digestive tract, the urinary tract, the reproductive tract goes, and all of those in ourselves weave through different orifices. In reptiles and birds, um, they all enter into the cloaca and they actually leave through that one orifice, which is, you know, I don't know, a, I don't know what a comparable thing is, but that's what the cloaca is. I don't know if that was helpful or not, Ruth. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, next question. Um, how can I protect turtle nests from uh, predation and allow for hatch hatchlings to exit? Um, you saw this picture in the talk. I've blown it up a little bit. Um, so we got the video of the nesting um, painted turtle because I got the call, Karen, Karen, um, what do we do now that it's nested? The best thing would be to not disturb the eggs, leave them right where they are, and protect them by laying some hardware cloth such as this. And ideally, I'd like to see it a little bit bigger than the piece you see here, but you work with what you have at hand. 
um, pin the hardware cloth down. Ideally, you'd pin it down with those um, garden staples that you hold your um, agricultural cloth down with. They're U-shaped, they're a pretty heavy gauge, and you just press them into the ground, or you weight it down with rocks, and then flag it just so that other people know this is a real thing and that's something they should just pick up and take away. Um, and then, ideally, you would get this done as soon as you saw that the female had left the area, because um, it's the odor that attracts the early predators, and the odor seems to do the most attraction in the first couple of days. And then I suggest that people leave the hardware cloth down for maybe a month, and then pick the hardware cloth up so that hatchlings um, have a free access to the world. Um, in Maine, most, we see, typically around 60 days plus or minus, depending on what the temperature was that season and depending on the species is when you could start to expect there might be some hatching. Um, you may or may not see the emerging as we've talked. And just prior to emerging, you'll see a little change in the surface of the ground. And a successful nesting the mother will have tamped the ground down so you can't even tell where the nest was. And just prior to emergence of the, the hatchlings will typically hatch when each one is ready to hatch. They have a um, hatching beak on their um, the front of their jaw. They call it a beak tooth, but they don't have tooth, teeth. Um, they actually have I don't know why, it's probably keratin that it's made of, and it just creates this little special, they kind of peck their way out with it, and that gets absorbed back into their body as they get older. So they'll, once the whole nest pretty much has hatched, they will emerge together. So what triggers emergence, I don't know. I think it'd probably be a great doctoral thesis for somebody. Um, but you'll see that the ground looks like it's starting to actually sift down and this, the dirt is getting a little depression there. And it almost looks like it's moving and they call it an eruption. And what they're doing is the turtles are climbing their way up to the surface en masse. And then you'll see them emerge as a pack and they'll dart around in a circle and they'll dart in the wrong direction. And then all of a sudden it's as if one of them figures out where they need to go and that one takes off and they all turn around and go with that one. They all hang together as if they're a school of fish. So that's what I would do to protect a nest. That's fascinating. Um, we, uh, we have one last question here and we back up to a five acre pond. We have a few painted and snapper turtles. What can we do to help the ecology of the pond to help those turtles? Um, not actually seeing your pond, I couldn't speak to it in specifics, but I think a pond that would be hospitable to both those species would actually have some algae in it, would have emergent vegetation, would have some woody debris, um, and I would also say that even though snapping turtles can tolerate a pretty toxic water, um, if the pond had a little inflow and a little outflow, so there was a little bit of oxygen coming into the space and out of the space, that might be a nice thing for the turtles. Um, I guess that's how I'd be thinking about it. I have been known to tie off large woody debris to the shoreline to provide basking habitat. So you could try something like that. Great, Ruth, uh, do we have any other questions that have come in? Let's see here. So there were there have been a couple of questions into the chat. Um, let me, I'll do one first that's pretty, well, I guess we'll just start at the beginning. Um, so the first question was, how big are wood turtles? How big are wood turtles? Yep. Um, 
uh, six, the dep obviously depending on the age, but an adult would be maybe six to seven inches long um, and maybe three and a half to four inches tall and maybe, I don't know, a couple of pounds. They're not super large. They're not like snappers. Snappers can get to be 75 pounds. And true story is this is kind of what got me into turtles. As a very young child, um, I lived on a lake or my family had a place on the lake. And the neighbor got a snapping turtle that was so big that he had to drag it in with the net behind the boat. And the boat was a lapstrake lineman and the thing must have weighed 75 pounds as I think about it. But I just remembered as a kid just being awestruck that this thing was in the water that I swam in. Um, there was one picture that uh, showed up in one of the slides where I'm holding a snapping turtle in a net and that snapping turtle came out of one of our alewife traps. That snapping turtle probably weighed 40 plus pounds and you saw that I had it in the net and that was the only way I could get it out of the trap and I was sort of was resting it on my thigh because I couldn't just hold it straight up. Um, so wood turtles are very manageable in size compared to the snapping turtle. Thank you. Um, the next question I think came when you were showing that picture with a turtle head sticking up next to the cattails. Um, someone says that they have a pond just like this. They've had frogs, but the frogs have vanished from the pond. Could they get a couple painted turtles? The frogs have vanished from the pond? Yes. Um, I think frogs, green frogs especially, cohabitate peacefully with um, painted turtles. So I don't think they're an exclusive either or thing. Um, yeah, and I, I'm not sure how you would quote unquote get a painted turtle, but it sounds like the pond could certainly support a painted turtle. Thank you. Um, someone had a comment about moving a snapping turtle. They said that mm -hmm. some um, showed them how to move a very large turtle by taking a garden shovel and flipping it on its back, then they slid the snapping turtle on its back off the road in the direction it wanted to go. That's very clever. That's a really good idea. If the turtle's that big, you basically turn the blade of the shovel into a sledge. And just like that snapping turtle suddenly didn't know what to do when it was flipped on its back, um, that is a, that's a good solution if the turtle's that big. Um, one thing I worry about is the turtle thrashing about trying to get upright and then making sure you had gloves on to actually do the flipping action. Um, then we had a winter turtle question. And so this was, when you say that snapping turtle and painting turtles are on the bottom in the winter, does that mm -hmm. the mud or just lying on the bottom? Do they eat at all during the winter? And can they be awakened? Um, so that's that's a nice question, and it's got some complicated answers. Um, typically, most turtles stop eating um, six weeks before they overwinter, whether they're overwintering on the land or in the water, and that's because um, their metabolism is slowing down, and they don't want to have anything in their gut rotting because they won't be processing it. Their, their metabolism will be so slowed down that they're not processing food. So they're not eating. They won't have eaten for a number of weeks before they actually overwintered. Um, painted turtles and um, snapping turtles sometimes are just on the bottom and it depends on the depth of water. And sometimes they're partially under debris, so there'll be a layer of mud over them or a layer of leaf litter or you know detritus over them. Um, both painted turtles and snapping turtles have been known to overwinter singly, but they've also been known to overwinter in groups. Um, and 
this could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Um, there was a, a study population of snapping turtles that river otters got to and basically killed them all and had dinner one winter. So um, they're, they're down there. They're not as deep as a musk turtle might go. They won't go down, they won't go down a foot into the substrate. Um, so they aren't eating, moving about. Um, if, so I think on average, they're not moving about. However, if they're interrupted because they're not in a true hibernation, um, hibernation is something that only certain mammals can do. They're actually ruminating. Um, and the reason they're not hibernating is a little bit outside my expertise, but reptiles can't control their metabolism or the, their body temperature. So they're just responding to the environment's temperature. So that's why it's called um, ruminating. Um, so when researchers have interrupted their winter, um, they have been known to move. Um, they've see, been seen moving. They haven't really been recorded moving a lot. And then the caveat I've got to say to that is um, when I had radios on the turtles that you saw um, a couple of slides ago, at that lake, um, there were bubblers, and you may or may not be aware of this, but something they do in a lot of um, big freshwater lakes is dock owners will leave their docks in, they will bubble so there's no ice formation around the dock that will lift it out of the lake. So um, concurrently, one of the winters I had um, pressure temperature transducers on the turtle and one of the turtles actually went to the surface and that was documented by the pressure change and temperature change on the data logger twice in a winter. And I've often assumed that it sensed the bubbler went up and got a breath of air in its lungs and then went back down um, because it was where we would go out and check where it was once a month. And they basically were all in the same area each time we would check. So that turtle clearly was moving. Um, but I think on average, you would say they're not doing a lot of moving because they don't have the energy, they don't have the calories. Just a couple more questions, Karen. Um, yep. One is the <laughs> invasive plants. Yeah. Tell me about the invasive plants question. Do turtles eat them? Invasive plants. Um, you must be thinking like purple loosestrife or something, something that's an emergent kind of invasive plant. Or maybe aquatic invasives uh, as well. I know there are. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. I don't know. I don't, I do not have any personal knowledge of that. I, that would be a very interesting thing because they have, um, the map turtle has been known to eat zebra mussels, which are considered an invasive species. So, Maybe some of our turtles could help control some of the invasive plants. That's a, that's a great question. I like it. <laughs> um, we had a, a quick question about turtle shells. So if people see the eggshells strewn about, is there a way to tell that whether they were hatched or predated? Like um, yes and no. It depends on the time of year. So clearly if I, the shot that was in one of the slides that I talked about. Um, if you were to look at that closely, you would see um, kind of the albium attachment was still in one of the eggs. And you could see if you had been at the site, you would have seen the fox tracks. <laughs> so that one was pretty self-explanatory what happened there. If you show up um, in the, yeah, I would think you probably could. Um, and partly because you would look at what time of year you're finding the eggshells. Um, are the eggshells sort of curled up as if they've been just crunched and now they've just dried? Because um, reptile eggs are not hard shelled like bird eggs, but rather they're leathery shelled. Um, so, 
they have a little different quality. They kind of curl on themselves. Um, and typically, if the couple of times that I found broken shells that were hatchling shells, they had a different look to them in terms of the shape. They weren't kind of curled up on themselves. They're sort of broken apart like they were chipped away from and part of it was whole and but it was missing. I mean it was just they yeah so I guess I guess it would be um seeing a couple of pictures of each type and you would start to notice there's subtle differences in the actual shell. But it's just like when you're looking at a bird you've never seen before, the first thing you do is you look at the range map is pretty much if it's the time of year that you don't have hatchlings, but you've got broken shells, that's a sign it was predated. Thank you. And then the last question of the evening, Karen, is do snappers stay away from swimmers? Yes. Again, because of their proactive defensiveness, they are not going to go after anything that they are smaller than. You know, they might, they might go for a duckling that happens to come right within range that they bite, oh, duckling gone. But if you see a big, dark shape disturbing the surface of the water, they're going the other direction. They're going to honker down. They're going to hope you go by. Um, yeah, no, they're not going to bother unless they're being agitated by the swimmer. Well, thank you very much, Karen. It looks like that's all the questions that we have. Well, thank everybody for sticking with us for so long. I'm sorry we ran over, but I can't help myself and I hope that you learned something. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it was very informative and I know we all, we all appreciated it. And thank you everybody for joining as well. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. It was great. <laughs>